Hello and welcome to the second seminar in the Deakin Science and Society Network Healthy Futures series. My name is Dr. Neera Bhatia. I'm an Associate Professor at the Deakin Law School. The Science and Society Network was formed in 2018 in recognition that scientists, humanities and social science researchers need to work together to meet the greatest challenges of this century. No single academic field can bring about the changes we need to see in the world. Bridging disciplines and divides is the key to finding new solutions to the problems we face today. The Science and Society Network supports early and mid-career researchers across the university who are embarking on groundbreaking interdisciplinary projects. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which each of us are today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For those of you who have not attended one of our seminars today, a quick rundown on the structure of today's event. I will introduce our speaker, Professor Dan Hunter, Dan will present for 30 minutes and then we will have discussant comments from Professor Raj Vasa and Pro Professor Jeff Craig before we throw to general discussion and Q&A from the audience. I will be chairing here on Zoom and my colleague Dr. Tao Fan will be moderating YouTube live chat. We're keen to hear from you and answer any questions you might have for Professor Dan Hunter a little later. You can either post your questions into the YouTube chat or you can post your questions on Twitter at SSN Deacon and make sure you use the hashtag, uh, hashtag SSN Seminar or hashtag Healthy Futures. Now to Dan. Professor Dan Hunter is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Law at Queensland University of Technology and was previously the founding Dean of Swinburne Law School. Professor Dan Hunter is an international expert in, in intellectual property and AI and law. He's the author of books on gamification, intellectual property and intelligent legal systems. His current research is focused on the use of innovation and technology within law including the use of AI in sentencing, criminal justice, the legal implications of autonomous systems, and the future of legal practice. He is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law and chief investigator in the $71 million ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making and Society. Please welcome Dan. Dan, over to you. Thanks so much, Nira, and uh, welcome everybody. And let me acknowledge um, the people uh, of the uh, Turbul and Yugra nations and um, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, they being the traditional owners of the land on which I am um, presenting today. So I'm gonna be talking about the death of the legal profession and the future of law. Um, and this is um, a topic that came about or a, a presentation that came about from my experience of thinking about what um, sorts of futures we should be imagining for um, uh, law and lawyers and what are the implications of the changes that technology particularly is um, driving in the legal system. System. So um, uh, when I when I um, uh, sent this paper out for, for review initially, um, the um, the the people that came back, the reviewers came back. Always, you know, it's always reviewer B who walks into a bar and says, "This is the worst library I've ever seen." But but reviewer B came back and, and said, um, "You know, shouldn't it be the death of a legal profession?" Question mark and the in brackets and the future of law and it, and it's just like, yeah. Except I think that that actually what we're seeing is is a really profound change to the nature of the way in which law is is done, and that has implications 
for our entire society. So in keeping with the um, theme um, of uh, this, uh, these particular um, presentations, uh, these seminars, and in keeping with the theme um, of the um, ARC Centre of Excellence, of which I'm a part, this is really um, uh, taking um, a HASS view, a health arts social sciences kind of view of the changes that are going to happen as a consequence of um, technology. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen okay. Giving me the thumbs up. Is that all right? No one's obviously you're there's no one saying no, um, so I'll I'll just move forward. So let me um, start by a quick thanks, Nira. A quick um, overview of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and the main, so the most important thing to sort of start with is this idea of um, that that rather than thinking about the legal profession, we're thinking about the legal services market, and what that means for society, and what that means for lawyers, and what it means for law students, and what it means for law professors like like Nira. Uh, and me, um, what it means for law, law schools, regulators, and, and, and so forth. So the reason that I do this, that you know, um, weird little strike through of the profession um, word is that um, uh, if you think about the way in which law is delivered, um, rather than thinking about it within the context of, of we've got a legal profession that's got you know, these barristers in wigs and these solicitors in, in nice suits, um, that actually rather think about it from the demand side. Like, so, so what is it that we actually have out there in the world? Um, and we have lots and lots of legal services needs. Like lots of people need lawyers and they need them in lots of different contexts, you know, whether it's criminal law, whether it's family law, whether it's cor corporate law, mergers and acquisitions, whether it's regulatory compliance, um, whether it's um, in relation to um, penology and criminology, you know, there's an enormous amount of, of legal needs out there. Um, and, and those are legal services needs. And typically those needs have either been addressed by the profession or they have have not been addressed at all, right? So, so, you know, the standard kind of problem that you hear about when thinking about the way that legal services are delivered is the idea that you know, we need to work really, really hard on access to justice. And the profession has been the one that has had control over the legal service delivery for a long time. And what I'm suggesting in this presentation is that the combination of market forces and technology um, is really changing that particular equation. And so we now have lots and lots of people who are providing legal services who are not part of the profession. And that has some really serious implications for um, ethical obligations. It has some really serious obligations for the way in which people are trained, it has some really serious obligations for what is the role of the profession and is there a, a role at all? Um, it has also very serious implications for what is the future of work in, uh, in law. So that's what this talk is about. So I'm going to talk about four things. Um, uh, commodification and virtualization are the first two. Um, and those are topics which are actually on us already, right? So these are um, things which have happened already, but which often go unnoticed. Um, and these have been driven by, as I said, the combination of market forces and, and technology. Um, and if you just sort of take a moment to stop and look around, you can see that sort of everywhere within law. So I'll talk about what each of those elements mean and then how they um, play out in the sorts of issues that we're going to be looking at about the, the future of, of legal service delivery. Um, then the, um, uh, the final two elements, the death of the, the law firm and AI and law, is really about features that are changing at the moment and that are happening. Uh, you can see them, but they're going to have implications over the next um, 10 to 20 years rather than um, we're sort of looking backwards and seeing that they've actually taken place. So that's the nature of the um, talk that, that we're going to have. Uh, what I'm going to give. Um, I'm going to talk about these two elements first the, around the present reality, and then I'm going to talk about um, the, the near future, what's going to happen next. So the first topic around this is commodification. Um, and um, I've thrown up a, a couple of, of graphics there. I'll talk, talk about those in a second. But when we talk about commodification, um, we're, we're talking about the idea that, that rather than having um, a bespoke service, we, we rather have commodities which are purchased, right? So um, think about a suit or a shirt. Actually, a shirt's perhaps a, a little bit better. It's, it's perfectly possible for, for me or you to go to Chauvet in, in Paris and buy um, a, a hand-tailored shirt, a bespoke shirt. And it's equally possible, of course, you know, to buy a, a suit or whatever in, in, um, in Savile Row. Um, but of course, most people don't do that because it costs a fortune. 
It costs an absolute fortune. So rather instead we purchase um, a shirt or a suit or, or a skirt or whatever as a commodity, right? And they are mass produced. Uh, they're produced in lots and lots of different um, sizes and colors. Um, there are all sorts of sustainable implications around that because there's a lot of waste that, that happens as a result of that. But in general, what it means um, is, is two things. People get access to the thing that they want through this, this commodity uh, or the commodification of, of this thing that used to be a service. Um, and they um, uh, and people who are um, overseas in lower cost environments are actually producing them and having them shipped. So international trade and labor market arbitrage or labor arbitrage where it's cheaper to, to produce things in Bangladesh or in Thailand or whatever um, means that, that those people actually are, lifted out of poverty which is an extraordinarily good thing notwithstanding that, that you know there may be abuses but but it's excellent that they are and china has ridden that that particular wave of course um and um and at the same time i can have a shirt that's much much cheaper than i would have to pay if i were purchasing it in a bespoke way um that particular process hasn't happened until fairly recently in law Right, we've assumed that the only way in which you can get legal service delivery is through a bespoke. Here, we will measure you up, and we will cut the cloth, and you can choose this and that, and so forth, and then you know, come back for three or four fittings, and it's incredibly expensive, which means that there's a lot of legal service needs that are unmet. People don't actually get access to to law in the way that they need to. What we're starting to see is a range of um, providers who are commodifying legal service delivery. So Legal Vision um, is, is an Australian provider that, that sort of packages up um, uh, basic sort of um, uh, legal documents. Legal Zoom is an Amer American equivalent. Um, the, the thing behind, which is Settle Easy, the online conveyancing experts, is a startup that, that I founded a few years ago, um, which provides online um, conveyancing, as you'd expect, um, and does so in sort of like a packaged way, and you don't have to go to a law you can do it all on your phone and so forth um, and and it's you know it's on, on target to, to do very well we just closed our series a etc cetera, etc cetera. but the point about this is that this process of commodification of legal services is starting as a consequence of really two things or has, has started a number of years ago the two things that, it, that really have driven it is um, the market force of entrepreneurship there's a lot of money out there um, uh, in, in venture capital and other sorts of um, uh, startup capital, which is driving um, the desire for people to, who want to enter this market to say, hang on, there's a unmet service need or there's a way that we can do this more efficiently. We can take that market, whether it's conveyancing, whether it's probate, whether it's family law, whether it's criminal law matters. And we can, once we've commodified that market, we can make lots and lots of money at scale through computers, right? The second thing is the thing on the on the right, which is um, a simple decision tree. These things have been around for ages. And this, this sort of rule-based reasoning system was um, what used to be called good, or what is now called good old fashioned AI. It was AI back when I first started doing AI, back in the, uh, the Pliocene era, um, when I first started my career, but these sorts of um, uh, rule-based systems um, that uh, take, you know, very, very simple kind of rules and have a, a, a computationally tractable form of this that actually means that it gets, you know, that, that it can drive the workflow automatically uh, means that you, that in combination with um, the money of venture capital ends up um, uh, driving this idea or this, this mechanism by which um, commodification of legal services have already started happening. The time frame for, for this change is um, is now, right? So um, we're already starting to see sort of some large scale changes to the market. We've seen that happen in the States quite a bit. There's been a bit of pushback from the ABA for, for years, but they've sort of given up. They sort of used to say, this is the unlicensed practice of law. And they've said, no, 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 it's, it's okay now. We're, we're going to forgive it. In Australia, we're starting to see some players emerge that are doing this kind of thing. Um, and, and legal tech, of course, is, is one of the big um, sort of stories within, within law schools and within, within law firms that you, you're starting to see. So uh, what are the major implications for this? Well, the implications are across all of the um, uh, all of law, right? Not just the, not just the profession. So within the profession, um, suburban solicitors are, are really at risk of this because um, suburban solicitors are um, very reliant upon things like um, conveyancing probate 
um, family law matters, small scale criminal matters. And those are exactly the ones which can be commodified really easily. Um, and whenever I've gone and talked to, to suburban solicitors about, well, um, do you think that you're at risk of this? Um, because of course they're not very technologically literate and they can't really, you know, do these sorts of things. They say, no, 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 people want to come and see me. They want to sit across the desk from me and, and so forth. And and that's the sort of um, argument that I that I think a lot of people said when um, online banking first emerged, where you said, no, 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 I actually want to go in and I want to talk to a teller. And, and it turns out, of course, that you don't, right? You just want to be able to do it conveniently and cheaply on your phone. And so I think we're, we're going to see some really major changes to the way that um, uh, suburban solicitors, sort of the high street firms, actually operate because they're expensive to operate and they rely upon easily commodifiable um, types of products. The um, uh, mid-sized firms, probably not so much, right? That's there's there, this particular sort of commodification, there, there'll be certain areas where, where it will, will affect them, but, but really not, not so much. This is really something that, it, that hits the suburban solicitors. And it, and it really dramatically affects um, students and grads because um, where they're going or depending on where they're they're going, um, there won't be a market for their services, right? So they um, they don't actually have the same access to um, small scale firms, or they're unlikely to have the same access because the people who are in those firms are going to be doing the work themselves because most of the work's going to be drying up, right? And then they'll be getting out, they'll be you know, hoping that they can make it through to retirement, but they won't be passing on their practices to, um, to juniors. So depending on where they go and depending on where they graduate in um, uh, in law school and depending on the law school that they go to, um, we're going to see some pretty significant changes to the way in which um, the, the, this environment operates for law schools and for, and for students. You know, the, the, the easiest one you can sort of say is it's really, really great if you happen to graduate top of your class at a GO8 law school, right? You'll be fine, right? This will not affect you. Everyone else um, is affected. And of course, what that means is for non-GO8 law schools, that they're pretty seriously affected um, because the um, value proposition for their degree is is going to be at risk. So either those schools will sort of understand that they need to start driving this kind of um, uh, technology, try to get their students some competitive advantage through understanding this sort of technology and, and what they can do with it, because there will, of course, be new jobs or just be alternate legal service providers or in these companies that are producing these things. Um, there are some pretty serious implications for the for the profession. Um, uh, the implication for the profession is that either they can embrace this or they can they can fight it. Typically, they fought it, um, and they fight it and say this is the unlicensed practice of law, and we we don't want these things. But eventually, um, that sort of um, a guild operation, we're here to protect. You know, it's a trade protection operation, um, fails, um, and what you start to see is that there are going to be lots of, A, they'll be behind the curve, right? They won't have actually incorporated this as part of their professional service um, mentality. And that the um, the thing that will, will happen is that you will start to see these sorts of providers, whether it's legal Zoom or legal vision or settle easy, um, they'll be providing legal, legal services, but they won't have lawyers involved. And that has some really interesting uh, implications for the ethics of legal service delivery, right? Right. So you become become a lawyer, you, you sign on, you, you, you sign the bar roll. Um, and part of that is that you agree to being a member of a learned profession with certain ethical obligations and so forth. These companies don't have those, right? They, they operate in a very different kind of environment. The regulators are fairly slow to, um, uh, to, to deal with this, the way of dealing with it is to simply say, well, you know, the director of the company needs to have a law degree or a conveyancing license or whatever. Um, but that's going to be insufficient when a lot of the stuff is this happening at lower levels and, and actually doesn't have anything to do with those directors. So we can talk about that in, in the questions. Perhaps it might be a, a fruitful topic of conversation. So that's something which has happened already um, and will continue to expand. The second thing um, that's happening already is, is offshoring virtualization and managed services. And, and the way in which this um, comes about is the same sorts of market forces that we've that we've seen already, which is to say, um, there are lower cost uh, labor markets out there in the world, right? That that um, 
uh, that, that operate where there are lots and lots of people who, um, in the case of, of our legal system, speak English because we need them to do so, um, are very, very smart. Just because you happen not to be born in Australia doesn't mean that you're not smart, of course, right? That's that's um, distributed across the planet. In Talent is distributed across the planet in, in, in the regular way. Um, and so very smart people who are very often very well trained in, in certain markets um, can actually start doing uh, legal um, delivery or legal service delivery from uh, the place where they live. Now, whether that place is um, initially a lot of this was done in India, right, these managed services or legal operations outsourcing firms um, started to pick up some, some legal service delivery in India. So that was often document discovery and the like. Um, these days, it, it is a range of different of products that they that they provide, um, and those products that are essentially products that are that are given to or sold to, um, uh, you know, big operations like PwC or KPMG. Sometimes um, law firms will will do this, um, and the the product is the end delivery of of a legal service, right? Read through, annotate, deal with ten thousand. Due diligence requirements in a in a merger and acquisition um, uh, deal, um, deal with the the ten million um, emails that that are um, in this particular piece of of litigation. So this sort of legal process, what used to be called legal process outsourcing, these days is usually called um, uh, legal ops or managed legal services, um, started in India. Um, it's migrated around. These days you get some in India, um, some in, in Bangladesh, some in, in um, South Africa actually has been a big provider these days. Um, and the idea is, is exactly the same sort of thing as we've talked about with commodification, except it's not about um, the um, using technology to to provide the services it's about the combination of technology and and people um, this has got to the point where there are entire organizations that are that are um, built around providing this this sort of infrastructure so there are companies that actually do it but also the thing the wheel that you see in the middle is uh, the clocks 10, 12 core competencies so Clock is an organization. It's uh, the, oh, I always forget it, it's a strange kind of name, um, but it's legal operatives, the consortium of legal operatives, something um, out of the States. And when it first started, it was a tiny little kind of club of, of um, general counsel at big companies saying, we need some people that can do the logistics of this, that can manage this as though it were a business issue rather than a legal issue. Um, the, the last time I think that they had um, a physical um, clock conference. They always have them in Las Vegas because it's about the only place where they can do it. And I think they had 6,000 people at that conference and that was about five years after it was created. So um, the scale of it is, is enormous. Um, what, is, what does this mean um, for um, when this happens and who it happens to? Well, it's happening already. Um, you're starting to see these, um, they're usually called ALSPs, alternative legal service providers, um, cropping up in lots and lots of different ways. So PwC has a new law um, practice, which was started by um, Nick Sheehy, who's the creator of Clock here in Australia, but was ex um, Telstra general counsel. Um, you have places like Ashurst Advance, which um, is a legal uh, operations um, outfit that is connected to Ashurst and does all of their managed legal services. And they do it, uh, there's one. Uh, outpost here in Brisbane and there's one also in Glasgow so you can have 24-hour delivery of these sorts of things so whether you're talking about you know, large large numbers of secured transactions that are happening around the clock um, though there's someone who's actually able to do it um, and the reason they pick Brisbane and Glasgow is that they are relatively low cost uh, onshore um, uh, places for delivery of of uh, legal services. So you see it both in terms of the offshoring as well as, as onshoring or nearshoring as it's sometimes called. Um, and these sorts of changes are, are being driven by the cost of legal service delivery, typically at the top end of the market, right? So, so um, the question then is who, who are the implications of this for? Or who does this hit the most? 
um, small firms um, less so, mid to large size firms quite serious, right? So unless they're actually investing in this, um, then they're going to be um, overtaken. And you see this in the in the large scale firms, the white the white shoe firms, you know, the um, the HSFs, the Linklaters, the or Allen's Linklaters, um, Ashes, and so on. They're all dipping their toe in the water in this particular arena. Um, what does this mean for students and graduates, and what does it mean for regulators? Um, it's it's quite serious because it means that you now have an international market for legal service delivery rather than a, a purely national or purely local market. So the extent to which um, graduates go out and expect to work at large firms to make enough money um, doing this sort of, you know, the, the low level scut work, the early scut work, that's that's going to dry up, right? That's going to be offshored or nearshored to somebody else. And so um, what it means is that there's a change in the way in which uh, young lawyers learn. So there's not so much the transmission of the ethical obligations. They don't really understand how to do things because they're not being trained to do things. They're just doing, you know, if, they're, if they're working at all in one of these managed services firms, then they're doing just you know one little thing time and time again. So that has some implications for their long-term training and their ability to, to be able to practice as lawyers and to be a, a fully functioning member of the profession. So again, we start to see the unraveling of, of the profession. We have some really serious implications for uh, regulators because of course <clears throat> they can't regulate those who are offshore um, and they may not even be able to regulate those who are nearshore, but we can talk about that in a different context. Okay, so those are the two things that have already happened. Um, we see them already out there. And so then the question is, okay, so what are the, the things that technology and, and the market is driving um, that haven't quite happened yet, but will happen soon? So let's have a look at two implications of the near future. Um, one is the death of the law firm and one is the, the implications of AI and law. Um, so the death of the law firm. Um, so so the the bust, uh, the marble bust on the, on the the top right is of Adam Smith, and the the picture on the on the the left is is a um, a stock photo of of what I like to think of as you know this is a this is a law firm or this is this is a company. Um, it actually shows a, uh, them looking out across the Chrysler building, Han Am building in, in New York, and there is actually no building that, that has that particular view, but we'll leave that for the moment. Okay, so um, so how do these two things fit together? Well, um, you know, Adam Smith in uh, The Wealth of Nations at the end of the, sorry, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution was, was trying to think through what are the implications of industrialization? That's, you know, obviously that's a ridiculous simplification of, of an extraordinary text but um, what he what he was interested in was was what is happening as artisans are leaving and industrialization is happening right and how does that affect nations but also and, and this was sort of the first thing that that uh, part of the observation that he was the first one to sort of make this observation that the the, the firm the company arises right but we typically call it the firm and so if you imagine um, his, his example was a pin maker, um, but, but I think an easier example is a, is a chair maker. At the, during the artisanal period, um, if you wanted a chair, you would go to um, a, an artisan and um, uh, you would say, well, I, I want you know, this set of dining room chairs and you would agree to what it would look like. And then he, it was always a he, would say, okay, you know, I'll make it and all that sort of stuff and then come back in eight weeks time. Um, so very much again, you know, sort of like that bespoke model that we've, that we've talked about before, but it was that was the only way in which anything was done. Um, of course, with the rise of industrialization, you could have um, people um, turning uh, the, the chair legs really, really quickly on a, on a lathe that was powered by, by um, steam or by, by water. Um, and you could have people fitting them together and so on. And so as a result, you had people who became specialists at, at certain jobs within making chairs and then you also needed a mechanism to coordinate all of that stuff because it was really no use if you didn't have uh if you had a you know a, a chair maker who was turning uh, who was able to turn chair legs but of course there was no wood there or there was no market you know no one had actually sold this sort of thing so you create this uh, this environment where you have specialists who need to be coordinated and as a result the firm emerges right um so up until recently uh, and of course, law firms operate in the same way, right? You've got the specialist lawyers, but you've got all the back end people. Um, you've got the marketing folks who do, you know, social media and PR and that sort of stuff. You've got bookkeepers um, and so on and so forth. Right? You even have specialization within 
the law, you know, the law practice itself, not just specialization in terms of someone's an employment lawyer, someone's an IP lawyer, but you've also got the partner, you've got the associates who actually control a lot of the work or do sort of a lot of the work. You've got the juniors who actually are doing all of the scut work and so on. So there's a lot of segmentation and specialization within the firm. Um, and that's the way that we assume that the firm has to happen. Well, we did assume that the only way in which you could coordinate stuff um, uh, was was either the firm or the market, right? Up until recently, those are essentially the two um, mechanisms in economics to be able to to coordinate functions. Um, but the rise of of Uber as an example, um, and lots and lots of other of these platform delivery uh, organisations, um, have demonstrated that you don't need. Um, a, a firm. You don't need a company in order to be able to make things happen. So Uber is is perhaps the best example. You know, until the rise of Uber, whether you think it's a good or a bad thing, um, uh, it is a thing. Um, but until the rise of Uber, we sort of assumed that if you wanted to get um, a ride from your home to the airport to go and deliver a paper back in the days when we used to actually do this live in person, um, the only way you could do it was to call up a, comp a taxi company and they had to have a communication infrastructure. They had to have the drivers who were, who were um, employees. You had people, you know, taking the calls. You had, you know, people that were servicing the company cars and all that sort of stuff. With Uber, we just have private contractors who own their own cars. The platform of Uber delivers this kind of thing um, and you're able to get out to the, to the, um, uh, out to the airport. Consider this within the context of the law firm, right? So, so you're starting to see firms which are becoming more and more virtual where all of the back end operations are um, a bit taking place via um, uh, outsource deliverers, right? So Zero does all of your bookkeeping for you. Um, your CRM is is done just easily, either by an outsource provider or alternatively um, through one of the the CRM uh, platforms that you've got. Um, you have your IT support handled by by a remote firm, and so actually now all you need is is just the individual lawyers to do it, and they don't have to be in the firm itself, or they don't have to be in a in a, an office. In fact, one thing that COVID has definitely done is driven this idea that we can have remote um, delivery of, of, um, of these services. And so you have a situation where um, various providers are trying to enter this market as the platform for lawyers, right? Where you say, okay, um, there is a senior partner or what was person and perfect, sorry, a person who previously was a senior partner, but now is just the rainmaker. They own the relationship with the client. When the client gives them work, they outsource that work to um, a team of lawyers who are not members of the firm, but they're independent contractors. They're rated in the same way as I rate my Uber driver. And you have a situation that, you know, Dan is Dan is a really good IP lawyer and, and he, this is his rate. It's, it's 150 bucks an hour. He's an independent contractor rather than paying um, Dan 150 bucks an hour for the time that he's just sitting around, you know, reading, reading the internet and waiting for the, for the thing to come in. That's his problem. But when the work comes in, he gets to do this um, kind of, of work straight away because the platform actually allows the rainmaker to actually start passing it out and ensuring the, the quality of the work. Um, what we're starting to see is, is the emergence of these already. Um, various bits of it. I won't go through all of them in too much detail, but I think over the next 20 years, we're going to see the gradual decentering of the law firm as the way in which um, these sorts of things um, are done, right? So that, that law firms are the only way in which you actually can practice law. Um, and so that has um, some really serious implications for our law students and our grads particularly. Okay, um, and the main reason that, that that serious implication is that we in law schools have not given really any thought to what it means to be a freelancer, right? We don't train our students with that idea, and that is really um, significant. It's going to be a major way in which um, lawyers are employed over the next um, ten to twenty years, and we're doing our students a real disservice if we don't make them understand that. That in fact they're not likely to to go into a law firm the age of 22 or whatever it is as a as a junior lawyer have their traineeship and then work their way up to to the the corner office that's just unlikely given this particular type of of platform economics that we see elsewhere um, i won't go through the implications for the other sorts of areas but they're quite they're quite serious as well and that i think we can see examples that are starting to happen but it's it's still an open question as to as to the significant of its, significance of um, of this particular change. 
The final um, major um, trend that we need to be aware of um, is artificial intelligence. And um, we could give a really, really long talk about AI and more, and, and indeed have done so in many contexts. But let me just give you a really quick version of, uh, of AI and law. And actually the main outcome of this is to, to argue or to suggest that actually, even though journalists say, oh, artificial intelligence is gonna take all of our jobs, it's actually not as significant in law as, as a lot of people think. It's gonna take a long time before AI really radically transforms the way that, that law is done. So um, the, a brief history of, of AI, it's, it's, it's 70 years old, give or take, um, it's what, no, 63 years old. Um, it was created in 1957 at a, at a conference in, in Dartmouth, New Hampshire, um, from some stuff that, that had happened before that. But it's, you know, as a, as a, um, uh, as a discipline, it's uh, important to understand it's a discipline of, a subdiscipline of computer science. Um, it sort of bumped along for a number of years um, from the 1950s through to, to um, basically about 2010, give or take. Um, and it was um, pretty interesting. I certainly found it interesting, but it really didn't have sort of any profound changes or not too many profound changes to the way in which um, things were done in society. Fuzzy logic, you know, turned up in um, in AI and then it turned up in washing machines, but that's about it, right? And until the 20, 2010s, um, a little bit before that. And at that point, um, three or perhaps four, depending on how you look at um, the... Um, the, the people that were there, but there are about th the three main um, uh, horsemen of the apocalypse uh, came along and created deep learning. So it's um, uh, Jeff Hinton, Jan Kuhn, and um, I'm blanking, I'll think of it. Um, anyway, you'll come back to me in a second. Um, created the, the mechanism of deep learning, um, created the algorithms that combined with data means that we actually have systems that are really remarkable um, and, um, and have really you know demonstrated intelligent behavior without us really understanding how they work or how they decide we understand how they work we're not understanding how they decide so a really simple example of this is the um the way in which um the the uh, early google uh, cars worked another example is siri they all work on in base basically the same way so it's a it's a neural network that learns based upon huge data sets what you have to do is you have to generate the huge data sets in order to be able to train the system to actually be able to make intelligent predictions about what it should do. So if you're training a car, you don't tell it this is a human being and then show, you know, and then say this is also a human being. What you do is you drive it around and you get it to avoid things, right? You have a human being behind the wheel and it avoids um, the you know, things that actually are human beings as well as other sorts of, uh, of things. And as long as you do that with enough data, and you have the sensors that are picking up what's going on, eventually it will start to recognise that these blobs that are sort of between about five feet and you know, six, six and a half feet maximum that have, you know, this round thing sitting on top of sort of a squared off shoulders kind of stuff, those are human beings. You need to avoid them. Don't drive into those, right? You're not giving them rules. You're not telling it anything other than this is a thing that you've got to avoid. And that's the way in which all of the really significant, sorry, all of the really significant AI um, systems that are out there these days um, actually work. And Siri is an example, I won't, won't go through it. Now, um, that has some really pretty serious implications for lots of areas of work, but less so within law. Now, um, give you a really quick example here. When we build, um, this is a slight digression, but, but I'll, I'll, I promise you we'll come back to AI in a second. When you build a, um, uh, a piece of, of uh, you know, a platform or something that actually operates on, on the web, um, you don't have to build all of the stuff all the way down. You don't have to worry about how it gets delivered over the internet. You don't have to worry about, you know, making the operating system to make sure that, that the stuff is displayed on, on the screen properly. You don't have to worry about all of the, the database stuff. You just worry, all of those things are, are divided up in what's called the stack, right? So if you're just doing something which is, you know, a new sort of, of platform that's delivered over the internet, right? Then you just really worry about stuff that might be your server side code in the middle, that orange orange bit. And you, the browser is already taken care of. You might have to do some client side code, but it's really, really easy because to, to build these things because they're divided up in these particular ways. 
Um, we're starting to see this happening within law and in the AI environment, right? So, so if you think about all of the functions of delivery of law, um, the, the understanding of cases and statutes or the retrieval of cases and statutes is sort of like the basic thing that you learn in, in law school. When I was doing law, when I was learning law, um, there really weren't very many, if any, automated um, information retrieval systems for that. You had to learn how to find cases and statutes. It was kind of a chore, right? Um, these days, you just log into Osley and you click search and it's done, right? So, so that particular function has been taken over by, by the computer system. Um, the same sort of thing you can start to see in, in other parts of the law stack. So if you look at the skills, which is the next level up, or judgment about the, the disposition, ethics and emotions, each of those levels of, of uh, above it in the stack are um, significant parts of legal service delivery. And we're probably at the point um, in the AI delivery of, of law at around about the skills level, right? So we're starting to see with things like GPT-3, um, we're starting to see with some, some um, other sorts of, of um, bespoke systems um, that um, some sorts of legal skills can be automated, but the judgment dispositions, ethics and emotions are really things which actually will be the um, domain of human beings for a really, really long time. Um, and although there are areas of, of research in AI, in each of those areas, like judgment dispositions, there are even, um, uh, there's even research into AI and emotion, um, but they're gonna be a long time coming. So for the purposes of, um, you know, people thinking about, well, what, what is the likely area um, of law that is going to, to be changed, that whether the future of work, um, there's really not many that you can think about and say, there's going to be a really big change that's going to happen here within law. Um, these particular examples that I've thrown up here are um, very different, right? These are areas that are going to be profoundly affected, areas of work that are going to be profoundly affected. They're not about law, right? So, long haul trucking, um, ophthalmology and radiology, those are examples of, of um, jobs that rely upon vision in many parts and assessment. Um, and we're already seeing um, that those are going to be changed pretty dramatically. You know, so if, you, if you're thinking of getting out of law or, or, and getting into long haul trucking, I'd advise against it because um, long haul trucking is just self-driving cars with a lot of money behind it. Um, ophthalmology and radiology, We've already seen machine vision systems um, having better predictions about um, small cell lung cancer, macular degeneration um, than human beings, right? So, so those are not areas where there are gonna, there's going to be a lot of growth. Within law, what are going to be the implications? Well, not very much. What you really see in law these days is that the, the AI um, changes are really happening at um, big firms. Um, and they are just being used to assist lawyers, not to change it, right? Now, that will mean that you probably won't see a vast proliferation of more jobs in those, in, in those areas, whether it's um, document discovery in big firms, whether it's um, due diligence for mergers and acquisitions that AI is doing these days, whether it's contract management, which AI is doing these days. What you're finding is that the sorts of jobs that are, that are out there um, are going to rely upon AI, right? So you're going to say, well, if I work in those sorts of firms, I need to understand AI. Just as, for example, accountancy changed a few years ago, you had to be able to understand um, how to use spreadsheets, not just how to use um, double entry bookkeeping in a, in a ledger. So it's not as though um, the law is going to, to change dramatically. And all of the jobs um, uh, predictions or all the predictions about massive job losses, you know, 47% of jobs will disappear in the next 25 years. That's really un unlikely. Right, we're we're much more likely to see um, uh, some some changes about the way that human beings have to work with AI, and that's certainly true in law. So the obligation, the uh, observation out of this, right? So the, this is my final slide, and then I will finish, and everyone will breathe a sigh of relief. Um, is um, that the legal profession becomes less important over time as a consequence, not of AI so much, but of these other combinations of technology and market forces, right? Um, the future of law will be working with 
um, computers and it will mean that the areas where there is growth is very different from the areas where there were growth prior to this period of, of sort of massive technological change and, and market change as a consequence of, of internationalization of legal services. Um, the most important implication I think is that um, we need to stop assuming that the only way in which um, law is delivered is via the legal profession. Um, and that will have some really interesting implications for all of the members of, um, of our society, because we are all affected in some way by the way in which uh, law is practiced. Um, I will stop sharing now and throw back to Nira. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I was frantically scribbling notes as, um, as you gave that excellent presentation. Um, before I ask any questions, I'd now like to invite our two discussants for their responses, um, Professor Raj Bassa and Professor Jeff Craig to um, bring their questions and add perspectives on the topic. I'll first um, introduce our, our discussants. Professor Raj Vasa heads translational research at the Applied Artificial Intelligence Institute at Deakin University. He has over two decades of experience spanning both industry and academia with deep skills uh, in artificial intelligence and complex software systems design. His career spans um, engineering, operations, and executive leadership in organizations across the world. Raj is passionate about solving high impact societal problems. His recent work spans building intelligent homes for the elderly, reducing traffic congestion, supporting decision-making in safety critical contexts, using gamification to improve dementia care, personalized education, and detecting spam and malware, Professor Vasa's research focus is in constructing robust AI systems. And then we also have Professor Jeff Craig, who's a professor in medical sciences at the School of Medicine at Deakin University, uh, based in Warren Ponds. Prior to working at Deakin, he spent 20 years as a researcher at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne and he studies the role of epigenetics in mediating the effects of early life uh, environment on the risk of chronic disease. And he's currently developing epigenetic biomarkers from easy to collect biosamples. So um, perhaps we'll start with you, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, wonderful presentation. And for the lawyers that are listening in, um, I've also developed in my industry time a product called CV Mail. Uh, and if you're a graduate lawyer, you probably hate me. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, um, very, very interesting talk. Uh, there's some things that uh, completely aligned uh, with Dan and some other comments that uh, I want to extend onto it. Um, the uh, commodification angle, uh, fully, it's uh, happened in IT. Um, the last 15 to 20 years and looks like um, some elements of that have come to legal profession as well. Um, it worked interestingly in IT um, in that tasks that are very procedural and processes that can be repeatable um, got offshored ex ex aggressively and progressively gone into the uberfied mode. So you, you could um, do some tasks essentially by giving a very high level spec and you'll get 20 people bid for you. Various things like that has, have happened. Um, similarly with uh, virtualization and remote workforces, um, again, IT probably has had to deal with this for the last 15 to 20 years. And uh, I, the specific impact in legal profession, I'm going to go with Dan's views on it to be true, uh, because he, he probably understands it a lot better than me. Uh, technology and AI, AI, I can make some comments about it. Um, one question I would like Dan to address would be that uh, in IT, what we found is small tasks that are small, highly repeatable got offshored and they work reasonably well, I should say. But where we noticed is teams that have worked collaboratively for a period of time. So teams that have remained more or less stable and worked for four to five years together, 
seem to be far more productive and can easily outcompete fragmented teams that are formed ad hoc. So almost like a, a trained army versus a mercenary army kind of battlefield. Um, I'm not sure if legal profession is similar in that sense, uh, in that uh, uh, that's something Dan can comment on. Like, are there teams, would teams do better than ad hoc composed people that come in and out kind of thing? Uh, because teams obviously can plan and they understand each other, the intuition's there. Um, so this is around the comment around do legal firms have to completely die? They certainly would like to, would may have to evolve and adjust. Uh, and maybe they don't need to work in really large teams, but in, in IT, we, we tend to work with teams of between 10 to 20 is not uncommon. Uh, larger teams are much more likely as well. Can, can I dive in, in on that on that observation? Sorry, am, am I yeah, supposed yeah. to leave it to sure, you? Sure. But I, I'm just really interested. I think I think it's a great observation and, and absolutely correct. Um, I think, or is very likely to to be the future of the law firm, right? Sorry, you say the death of the law firm. It's it's actually not really the death. You know, it's just the change in the way in which the firm kind of operates. And so, um, so yes, you're absolutely right. You know, all of the studies around the way that people work is that the teams are generally more effective than than isolated individuals for you know complicated sorts of processes. Um, you know, and they and then because of the coordination function, they sort of understand what their role is and, and those those aspects. I think what 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 that really means is that we will see um, smaller scale firms where um, a lot of the sort of the back end operations and a lot of the other sorts of stuff is outsourced, right? So, you, so, you know, when you think about a big firm, you know, they've got a PR operation, they've got accountants, they've got all that sort of stuff, that sort of stuff will be outsourced. So you'll then just sort of have, okay, we've got the core team, it's much smaller than it, than it used to be, right? It doesn't have any of the back office people. And what you've got is a small team of, of say five or 10 people that are doing this really, really high end work. And when they've got other um, uh, things that have got to be done, they're not going to hire new people in. What they'll do is they get freelancers to pick up some bits, but the team will sort of coordinate the function. Now, that means that the firm shrinks in size and our expectations of the idea that firms just get bigger and bigger or that um, you know we end up with more big firms and those sorts of things. I think that's really the most likely observation. But you're right. I think that the idea that the, the the firm as team is probably the best way of kind of thinking about this. And then you'll have some freelancers around. So I mean, um, that would pose an interesting side effect in that uh, the current model, um, you start as a junior. And uh, again, I don't know the number of years. I, I assume it'll probably take 10 years before you have gained sufficient experience and you could be trusted with serious work. Now, if it's a small team, how does that first 10 years play out in the legal profession? In IT, we're lucky in that the large, gigantic IT outsourcing companies out of India and to some extent US engineering firms have uh, been very wealthy and they could afford to invest in that generation and grow them. Uh, because there's a significant amount of investment that has to go in beyond the, what the universities prepared them for. And that decade of training happens and then the top get picked up into the elite groups. Now, yeah. how would that play out in a legal firm if they don't I, invest? I, and I think that's probably in many ways the that that is one observation um, around uh, the you know, the observation around the training need and the, the the gap between what happens when you leave law school or when you leave you know the university and how you get to the point of actually being productive and, and a member of that particular group um, who's able to do these things. That's, if anything, I would say the most serious implications of all of these technology changes because um, there just isn't the money in law firms to be able to underwrite that type of um, uh, that type of training. And increasingly, I think we're going to see a gap um, of you know the three years or five years out of out of law where you're going to find a whole lot of law students who are not going to be or law graduates who are not going to be able to get training um, the clients don't pay for it um, they, they literally won't anymore you know they will say to the law firms we're not going to pay for first year um, graduates um, that's your problem and of course the firms don't, don't have the money to do it and so I do think that there's um, going to be a huge education and training gap um, that, that emerges um, which um, as you say hasn't happened in IT but I think it's much more likely to happen in 
Okay, yep, yep. and in the, the second comment I want to make around the AI, again, fully agree, uh, it's no threat to any serious human endeavor. Um, where I can see AI coming in sooner than your timeline is probably tooling to speed up lawyers in some tasks, uh, probably uh, document decomposition to identify where they should pay attention, um, certain clauses that stand out to a machine. Uh, so the, the human experts can quickly pick, pick for that. Um, and the bigger role for lawyers and AI is likely, at least in the next five years, is probably we are still learning how to regulate this technology. Um, and, and there'll be some interaction between technologists and lawyers to help various regulatory bodies to build policies that are more sensible. Uh, rather than panicking about the fact that it's going to cause serious issues. Um, it, it, it's, it is going to cause serious issues if you throw it in by believing the hype. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not likely to be anywhere like Hollywood. Uh, and in particular, like um, legal liability, I want to comment around who's liable. Like right now, the, the AI people are hiding and saying, well, it's the historical data. But data is probably half the equation. The other half is a bunch of engineers got together and made a set of assumptions and designed an algorithm to implement that data. Now, would they have any liability or is it going to be like technology in general where we just write this nice warranty and says, use it your own risk and we don't call us and don't blame us if something goes wrong? Yeah, that, so so um, those are great questions, um, which I don't address at all in this in this paper, right? So I'm um, you okay. know in this this one, uh, you know, the, the first observation you made around lawyers are going to be working with AI, the you know the sort of like the intentional aspect um, of you know look look here or removing a lot of the sort of the scut work around um, analyzing texts. You know, that's that's where you find um, document document discovery systems or technology assisted review um, uh, document uh, sorry um, due diligence work emerges acquisition contract management those are those are absolutely examples that um, uh, validate what you've just said the the larger question that you've raised around liability but also around um, ethical and legal issues for um, systems that are data driven which are not easily explicable you know you just you can't ask um, any of the data driven systems why did you make this decision and it says oh because there's a rule you know and I was just following the rule that's absolutely not what happens and so um, that is um, literally the seven year question that we are addressing in the center of excellence and and it's sort of off off to one side happy to talk about that lots of things absolutely. and and, the, and there are, there's a very um, robust um, uh, literature these days around fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. I think there's entire communities around that, as well as communities that are looking at the question of liability. Um, I have a very particular take on liability, which is which is extremely strange, and I'll I'll tell you about it one of these days. But it's about the the same reason that that they used to uh, try and execute pigs in the Middle Ages. That in fact they we're actually going to end up with pig trials for uh, machine learning systems. But um, that's a topic for another day. Fair enough. Um, over to you, Jeff. Yeah. I, I understand Jeff is having NBN uh, and visit from NBN at any time. So, um, Jeff, I okay. understand if you go offline, that's the reason. So, okay, thanks for well, we his understanding. Um, thanks for a great talk, Dan. I, um, I think it's always great when you hear future thinkers because many don't think. Uh, further than the end of their nose. So it's really good. And it's also resonated with me as someone who studies genomics and, and genetic testing, um, that there's, there's parallels that keep coming up. I was reading a, a great paper by my, uh, yesterday by my co uh, colleague Sandeep Reddy on a, about a government's model for application of AI in healthcare. Um, and even though it's one stage away from what I'm uh, um, studying it it resonated as as did your talk and the the kind of issues that came up of course are the, are the commodification the offshoring etc but the two that that um resonated with me most i think rogers touched on the liability aspect of it you know you've got uh, and that's related to the transparency of the ai um ai can get uh, you know there's the first authors then it gets updated presumably legislation gets updated it gets interpreted and if it's in this kind of myst mysterious package 
And in genomics, there are these the, the, there is these packages that are released where some companies don't actually say what's in there. So it's a black box and you don't know whether it's been updated. And so that would be my fear for the future is that these, you know, the issue of transparency about what's in these packages. And of course, as Raj said, the, the, the issue of liability, um, who's responsible for, for malpractice? Uh, does the, the person, the, the end person seeing that the client say, well, it's not my fault, it's in there somewhere. Then they have to track back to who, to who, uh, who was at fault. Um, and also, um, yeah, so this, these are, I think, the main themes. And also, presumably, law, um, laws differ between countries. So if something's outsourced to another country, then, or for example, if I send my, uh, when we send our samples, biosamples and data out to the US, we have to tell participants that their data and samples are, are, are not subject to the type legislation we have in Australia. So I guess that's part of the, the globalization, but that affects the actual, um, the interface between the person uh, being cons um, doing the consulting and, and the client. So I wonder if you can expand on, on those issues at all. Yeah, those, um, there's, there's five talks in, in, in uh, that at least, um, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to do it quickly. And especially, I'll come back to the, the sort of the liability question that Raj raised that I've sort of tossed away before. And, but the, let me start with um, the black box problem that you're talking about with genomics packages and which, which is really serious within, within AI. It has, has implications um, for legal practice, but let me not talk about that. So let's just, let's just talk about how do we deal with the problem of um, explaining how these systems work and what do we do when they fail or there's an issue around it. Okay, so um, let, let me give you a, a simple example. I was talking to some, some guys that build machine learning systems um, and uh, they deploy them in, in lots of different areas, but the one that they were concerned about was um, insurance claims. And so these systems are making determinations about whether or not an insurance claim is, is um, correct or not, whether they're gonna pay out on it. And you can do this in lots of different areas. You know, is, is this a fraudulent transaction, whatever it might be, but these are insurance claims. And so they have a system um, that, that automates this. Um, and the insurance companies are delighted about it. I think it's fantastic because it's much, much cheaper than, than having all, all of these people doing it. Um, but of course, when you ask the system, well, why did you make that decision? It just sort of shrugs and goes, because I've seen data in the past, right? Like that's it, you know, like the, literally of the, I, these are black boxes. But more than that, they're actually um, black boxes where all of the risk and compliance issues that used to be done at the board level, right, are now done in, in a computer system. And so the companies are assuming that they're fine as long as the system is making these, these decisions. And, and they're not, right? You know, the, the Royal Commission on, on Banking was, was created as a consequence of some decisions that were automatically made by machine learning systems around, uh, you know, the, the ANZ and CBA and, that around, and people lost their jobs, CEOs lost their jobs and, and chairs lost their jobs. Um, as a consequence of these things saying, yep, that's absolutely fine. This is not a, an anti-money laundering problem. And so of course the, the, the system failed and then these people lost their jobs and billions of dollars were, were, were lost and so on. So um, we're seeing lots and lots of examples of this that are happening all the time. And this is not a, an issue that's happening in the future. It's happening right now. And we don't have adequate audit protocols to be able to understand when we should be worried about these things and when we shouldn't in the same way as around genomic packages we just sort of say well maybe we're okay with certain sorts of um ones of these but not these ones over here because they're particularly worrying we're still struggling to catch up and of course the lawyers don't really understand this technology very well and the lawmakers the regulators don't understand it at all and so we're in this really really awkward point where we don't really have a good answer to what should be the audit requirements? What should be the protocols? What should be, what do we What do we mean when we say we want them to be able to explain their decisions? And then coming onto the final point, which was Raj's question, who's liable when they screw up, right? And, and, we, and the short answer is we just don't really know. There are certain areas that we can sort of fix. So in self-driving cars, for example, we can just say, all right, manufacturers are 
liable all the time and they take out insurance or we create a, um, a no fault liability thing in the same way that we have with transport accident commission, right? We, you know, where you're in an accident. Okay. You know, doesn't matter who was at fault. Essentially, you know, you're going to get reimbursed for, for the, the loss that you suffered, even if the person is uninsured. Um, so we can do that in certain areas, but we can't do it in every single area that AI um, affects. Um, and there are going to be lots and lots of problems that, that are going to happen. If, if I, um, you know, if I were minded to, to or if I had a little bit more time, you know, the thing that I would be doing is, is building a team of, of um, AI engineers together with a bunch of lawyers and, and governance people to say this is these are the mechanisms by which we ensure that these things are okay and go out there and, and form that team and, and sell it to AWC or whoever. So that, that resonates with the idea of putting together a governance model before um, before things get re get real as it were. Well, well to, to, uh, we yeah, and, and, these and regulations. And, and we need to understand the governance model. So I've, so I've got a, um, a research project that I, at the moment um, with the um, uh, TES uh, DCRC, right? So the Trusted Autonomous Systems Defense uh, Cooperative Research Center um, and, and the Queensland government. And so the particular issue that they're worried about is uh, the regulation of, of military drones because one particular issue is obviously safety. So you say, okay, this drone is is controlled by a machine learning system, right? It's autonomous, it goes off and does stuff. And so the way that we normally regulate in that area is that we say, okay, you've got to come in, you've got to get it tested and we say, yes, it's safe. In the same way as you get, you know, your, the car tested, you know, you're bringing out a new model of car, does it comply with in, environmental requirements? Is it safe to drive all those sorts of things? So you have a testing system there. With autonomous drones, that are learning, the, the system is different next week than it was when it was tested. So, so do you have to go back and actually re-regulate the whole thing? Because it's now learned, right? And, and it's especially problematic where you've got drone swarms because they're actually communicating with each other. And, and so one is very different from three, which is very different from 10. So how do you actually regulate that? We've got no idea how to do that. We have absolutely no idea, right? Our normal mechanisms of governance and, and regulation don't work. And so we're trying to come up with some mechanisms by which we can say, okay, are there ways of us having a regulatory structure that, that conforms with, you know, we want this stuff to work and, and happen and be out there, but at the same time, we've got a whole series of public policy implications that we, that we really haven't addressed. They're, they're really fascinating questions. Okay, I've got uh, Jeff. Any anything else, or can I press on? No, that's fine for okay, me. Thank I'll, you. I'll hold back with my questions for now. I've got a question and a comment. So the question comes from our very own Tao, and uh, that question is: um, As the core work of the of legal professions, we have seen in many industries, such as our own in higher education, that admin and professional staff have uh, become very expendable. But despite claims that we can employ systems to automate those tasks, what actually happens is that labor becomes individualized and redistributed such that the remaining higher ed professionals have to do additional labor on top of their jobs. Might this be the case with law? Um, yeah, I think that the technology um, generally does that it does, it does many sorts of things as well but but what you tend to find is that um, it takes away certain uh, types of work so it, it automates you know bookkeeping or it automates um, you know various sorts of functions that previously were done by lawyers so so that then means that the people that were doing those sorts of things move into the precariat you know they they don't have stable work um, they might be you know work helping those systems but they they've got very very kind of atomized type of work uh, product the the fill in stuff that human beings used to do has to go somewhere because machines are not very flexible, um, even if they're even if they're you know, um, learning systems, and so someone's got to pick that up. The the example that Tao is is giving is is around sort of the movement away from professional staff supporting. You know, we have fewer professional staff, more automated systems. So now academics have to do that, and I think um, that we already see that in uh, lots of areas of law. 
Um, re really simple example. Um, I, I remember, I am old enough to remember that when I went out as a lawyer, I had a secretary, right? That, that idea is completely impossible to imagine these days, right? You've, you do your own typing, you answer your own email, you do your own, like, and so that sort of movement to, um, you know, rather than more specialization, actually more generalization for a certain number is I think inevitable within, within certain areas of law. Right. That, that's whether that's driven by technology or just sort of market forces and the idea of efficiency um, is, you know, is, is a question. And I, and I certainly wouldn't want to comment on that in relation to higher education, given all of the problems that we've had in the last year yeah. or so. A comment from uh, Vicky Huang. And the comment is with increase in decentralization, we will likely have an increase in legal regulation, perhaps an area of the legal profession that will grow with AI. Yes, absolutely. So, so I mean, that's a that's a great example for those that are interested in in the regulation of the legal profession. Um, you know, it used to be the case that um, the the profession would do it. You know, that in fact the um, uh, regulators would sort of hand on that that obligation to sort of regulate things and get things done. It would would give them to um, the profession, and the senior members of the profession would say, "Yes, you know, Dan, you've been a been a bad boy. Don't do that," or sort of give guidance around that. Um, I think that there will be um, less of that type of behaviour because they'll be controlling less of it. And so what we'll see is the need for more explicit regulation for alternative legal service providers saying you can do this, but you can't do this. And that will then mean that someone's got to write those laws, someone's got to understand what's going on with the legal service providers that are technology mediated. Um, and there will be opportunities for, for smart lawyers with, with some, some technical understanding to be able to, to work in that area in the same way as there will be um, enormous number of opportunities for uh, lawyers with an understanding of what actually goes on with AI and actually can name the third horseman of the apocalypse for convolutional neural networks, which was Josh Bingio. Um, and there's Jürgen Schmidhaber who, who actually claims that he was anyway, but, um, but yeah, so, so those are uh, the sorts of new law jobs that are going to emerge that are, that are sort of technology driven. Great. Another question's come in from uh, Radhika Garur, and she is asking to what extent is decision-making in government also being, um, Algor algorithmized well, uh, yeah. what would be the implications for the ability to govern re-AI? So, so the imp important thing to understand is that um, the, the automi automation or the algorithmization of government decision-making and ministry decision-making um, has, has been the reality for um, almost the last 20 years. Uh, when, I, when I first got into um, AI and law uh, back, as I said, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, there was an Australian company called Softlaw um, that um, was doing rule-based systems. You know, these days we think of it as really, really straightforward. Even back then it was, it was really pretty straightforward stuff, but it was building really, really large scale enterprise rule-based systems that would automate government decision-making based upon laws and regulations. Right? And they said, okay, we are going to take these ones and we're going to put them into this. And if you are eligible for a pension, for a military benefit, for Centrelink benefits or whatever, we will create systems that actually do that. So, so that was called soft law. Um, it got sold to Oracle. It's now called OPA, Oracle Policy Advisor. Um, and it runs throughout vast numbers of uh, government, federal government and um, any single um, uh, benefit that you get is um, driven by uh, these automated decision-making systems that are, in a sense, very old-fashioned. They're not data-driven, they're rule-driven. Um, and I think the last time I looked at least one, I think it was Homeland Affairs, um, the department, I think it, there were 5 million individual decisions that were generated by that system last year. Okay, and that's that was just one department. So, in an, in answer to the question, Radhika, um, already we see enormous numbers of those decisions being being made um, at, at that sort of level. But there are lots of other ones that are being made. That if you just think about it for a moment, the um, uh, the 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 way in which, for example, you are fined for speed cameras, that's an automated decision making system, right? 
you drive you drive too fast down you know the the um, freeway uh, between Warren Ponds and and Melbourne, um, which I've driven many many times back when I used to work at Deakin, and these days more more recently when I go down the Great Ocean Road, um, and you know the thing that you notice like the difference between when I was driving it. 20 something years ago down to Warren Ponds from, from Melbourne when I was working at, at, at Warren Ponds. Um, and now is that nobody speeds. I don't know if you've noticed, right? But everybody knows that what's going to happen is that there are speed cameras all the way along there and everyone does 103, right? Not, not a single, you know, click above, uh, you know, 102, 103. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a range that you can sort of get away with, right? Um, and the reason for that is that you go too fast, the radar will pick you up, it takes a picture of your, um, uh, of your number plate. That's automatically uh, rendered into, um, into ASCII, right, by a machine vision system that then goes into a rule-based system that actually automatically generates the fine and it's sent out to you and no human being looks at that at all, right? Not a single one. Right, and and the best that you can do is say it wasn't me. There was some mud on there, and that was an E. That was an F, not an E, or something like that. Right, it wasn't my number plate. But you're never going to get away with that right? because the systems are so good these days. So, the the reality is that we are already in an algorithmic state. Right, the state regulates us through algorithms all of the time. We don't even notice it. Um, there's going to be a lot more of it over the next few years. And Fun times, another, huh? question, another question. Another um, question. We have a question from Ben Ben Wills. And Ben's question is, in terms of follow-on effects, what are the implications for criminal and public policy-orientated law? Will there, be, um, will there be increased competition in all areas as business civil market contracts? Um, uh, so, I, so I think the, I think the questions are, this is not so much around the sort of the AI stuff as around the sort of the, the topic of, of the conversation, like what are the changes that technology has driven for, um, uh, for the legal profession? Um, I, th I think the answer to that question is, is um, well, so the question, will there be more competition? The answer is yes, right? And, and the reason for that is that um, we used to just have lawyers as the only ones who could deliver legal services, and now we don't. Right, and so as soon as you have other people able to enter the market, particularly others who are driven by technology, which tends to scale really well, whereas humans don't scale well. Right, if you want to get another human being to come and do some work, it costs you a human being. They're expensive. Right, if you want to do, you know, building something in a in a, pl a platform, um, up upfront cost quite expensive. After that. Zero, you know, so so you're, you know, it's like like drug production, right? The first one costs a billion dollars. The second, well, second pill costs um, five cents. Same sort of thing in in technology. So so I think what we will see is more more competition that will drive non uh, technology mediated lawyers out of markets, which is really what I was talking about around commodification, for example. Um, and we'll see new players. We've already seen new players enter various types of markets that used to be just law. So I'll, gi I'll give you a really simple example and, and the implications of it. Um, I used to teach in, in New York at, at New York Law School. And, and so we would charge $55,000 a year, sticker price, US, um, for three years for a student to get a JD. So they would, they would exit law school with essentially a mortgage debt. You know, it was like in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of some of the kids. Um, and one of the ways in which you could, they could justify that sort of upfront cost was to say, well, they're going to go and get a job in a white shoe law firm. Day one, they start making $160,000 in New York, right? And they can pay down that debt. A lot of the stuff that they were doing was um, document discovery. They were sitting in a basement, reading through thousands of documents, saying whether this was relevant or whether this wasn't relevant. With the emergence of, of technology-assisted review, those jobs go away. So all of a sudden, the students don't come. And all of a sudden, New York Law School has essentially in, in, in two years, uh, one year we, we had an entry class of 720 and 
two years later, we had an entering class of 280. That has pretty serious implications for the viability of that school, right? So, so that's the way that competition via technology really radically transforms an entire way of, of, of life, right? Law professors lost, lost their jobs. Law schools um, have gone under in, in the States, not, not so much here. Um, law students or, or prospective law students have gone elsewhere. And we, I think, going to see similar sorts of things, perhaps not at the same scale, because um, the, the the money is slightly different, but that's that's the the effect of it. I hope There's that another question. question, but I'll come back to it because it's a great segue into the question I want to ask. Um, there's a question that's come in from uh, Rita, um, and perhaps Raj, you might want to step in for this one, and then we'll jump back to Ben and Dan. Um, Rita's question. Uh, firstly, she says, "Fantastic lecture, Dan." So that's kudos Thank to you. you. Thank My question is um, about AI and the application of facial recognition cameras. For AI learning and a lot of facial databases that are used, what are the ethical implications here? Um, Raj, I know you've done a lot of work around facial recognition cameras. Perhaps you might want to comment and then Dan? Um, we, we've been going through facial recognition systems for a while now, especially at uh, border control with passports. Uh, they're almost commoditized everywhere now. Um, and there are technologies now that can recognize you and open a door lock for your house. Ethical implications, if it's regulated and there's proper dispute resolution processes, it may be acceptable. Uh, beyond that, I would be uncomfortable uh, with it. Uh, but uh, Dan... Do you have any more proper comment on that too? Oh, I, it's, I don't know. It's a proper comment, but I can make some some comment about um, uh, about the ethical implications of, of of AI. So, so one of the most interesting changes that's happened within the AI environment has probably been driven by machine uh, vision research, and that is that um, over the last couple of years, um, the uh, conferences for the first time, there are um, assessments that have to be made about the ethical, not, not have to be, in many of the big conferences like NeurIPS, which is one of the, the, the biggest machine learning um, conferences, um, and a number of other ones that the ACM puts on, um, you, you have to have an assessment of the ethical implications of this research, right? It used to just be, you you know, the, the researchers would just, um, you know, say, well, I've, I've got this system, it, it does better at, at understanding, you know, um, or recognizing, you know, Jeff's face or reduce you know, blah, 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 this is the algorithm and so on. And this is the data sets it was trained on. And then it was like, you know, it's, that's, that's fine, you know, and, and there's, there's been this pushback, you know, the, the example that was um, that was given some. There was someone stormed out of a of one of the early, well, early but recent AI conferences that didn't have ethical analysis as part of the requirements, and and said, you know, a la the the German uh, V2 scientists who who moved across. It was like, you know, I only care if the rocket goes up. Who cares where it lands? You know, and and it's just like that's no longer acceptable. It's no longer acceptable in this environment to say I don't have to care about the ethical issues. And and so machine vision has been one area that's been particularly particularly problematic because of the implications, for example, for um, state-sponsored surveillance of uh, ethnic minorities, you know, the big issues about the Uyghurs in, in China, right? And that's all done through machine vision, well, not all, but but largely done through machine vision and machine recognition. Um, and, and so those sorts of questions about the ethical obligations that emerge around surveillance for machine vision are one of the real hot um, topics within, within the ethics of, of AI. Um, that's not going to go away uh, anytime soon. Um, another another example, and, and it was really interesting. Um, there was there was a researcher who was doing an analysis of whether or not they could predict facial shapes based upon voice, and they went, okay, you know, right, that's you know seems like an interesting question. There's a voice. We've got a whole lot of data around. This is what people look like when they're speaking. So their you know their their jaw needs to look like this if it, they sound like this and so on and so forth, right? You go, okay, fine, that's no problem. Um, uh, gender activists said this is transphobic because of course, right, the physical um, makeup of, of someone is not their gender identity, right? And so they're saying, okay, you, you say that I look like this man, but in fact, I identify as, as, a, as a trans woman and, you know, and this is my gender identity. And so those sorts of implications, computer scientists have been very um, slow to sort of recognize, but they're starting to actually get there. 
Um, but there are, you know, the, the obvious observation is there are huge implications around the ethics of, of, of machine vision particularly, but so many of these areas as well. I'll come back to um, Ben's question. And it was a more of a general question. Uh, it's a, quite a big question, actually. What is your advice for young people thinking about law school? Question mark. Should they avoid? So that's a big question there, Dan. No, no, no. It's a, a, a um, dean, of, dean of law. I have to I have to say, no, no, no. You know, it's just make sure make sure you, you you come to law school. There are lots of good reasons for coming to law school. Um, what what I would say is um, think really seriously about um, where you go to law school. And that all, uh, and and ask the the law school, right? How, how have you thought about the future? Okay, and and I think you know every every law school dean is worried about this particular problem, and they're responding to it in different ways. Um, the the thing that's most important is to say, okay, um, think a little bit about what is likely to be the case in five years' time, and then what's likely to be the case in ten years' time. That's what really this talk, you know, came from. You know, I, I went and spent. You know, hundreds of hours going and talking to people when I first became a law school dean at, at Swinburne. And I would just go down and say, so what does the future of law look like? And they go, well, there's this and this and this. And then so I sort of pieced it all together and said, okay, this is what I think is happening. There are lots of other things that are happening, but, but these are the sorts of things. And as a law student, um, you'll have great outcomes if you understand a bit about technology. Um, you'll have great outcomes if you position yourself to say, I'm not going to do the things that are likely to go away, right? And, you know, don't, don't go into, you know, leather work thinking that you're going to be making horse buggy whips because guess what? You know, they're, you know horses are not going to be around. They're self-driving cars. We don't need too many buggy whips, right? So, so actually go and, and do something where it's like, okay, I need to understand enough about AI to be the sort of person that's hired by the government or by law firms to be able to say, this is, is what, um, you know, this is what the future is. I need to know it. One of the things that, that um, young people have is a, is a greater um, plasticity, I think. You know, they don't know much about what's already happened. They don't have a lot of experience, but they're prepared to learn and lots and lots of lawyers are not, right? So you see people out there who are dealing with their um, clients and their clients say, we need to understand about machine vision. And they kind of go, well, why? It's just like, well, because the client's the road traffic authority and they're really worried about machine vision systems and they need to understand it. And so I have, for example, sold uh, law firms on underwriting a PhD scholarship where one of the students comes in and talks to them about and writes white papers around the ethical implications of machine vision, right? So get into those sorts of areas because there's lo lots of jobs. I've got one ex-student who happened to do computer science and law and and i have he, he's just ridiculously talented when i said for one of the startups that i was producing oh you know can jules can you do some wireframes and he said what are wireframes i said the thing that we taught you in, in legal tech you know using using balsamic but but there's this new one figma and he said okay fine went away came back a week later and he'd done an entire wireframe in in figma like we just gave it to the developers and they said okay great you know it's it's done and he just said, yeah, I'm willing to learn. I'm prepared to do that. And he'll have an amazing future. So, so I would say, absolutely, law school is a fantastic place uh, to learn. You get access to the levers of power, but you do have to think about, um, you know, don't, don't make buggy whips or don't learn how to make buggy whips. Make sure that you learn how to make self-driving cars. So my, my questions, I've got, a, I've got a couple. Do you think, and I know you talked about certain areas that you think, you know, in the future we 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 can see those being looked after by AI, you know, certain particular areas. Do you think there are certain areas of law in, and where law firms currently uh, undertake work where we go, no, definitely not. We're still going to need bread and butter law firms or lawyers for particular areas that are so expert, so niche, that no amount of machine learning, AI, whatever technology can ever overtake or over, you know, uh, yeah, so, so, two, so two areas that, are, that you're going to be fine. Um, if you are in, uh, you, you are the best in your field in um, high-end commercial practice, right? So all of the senior partners in commercial law at um, Allens and HSF and, and you know, Montreal, they, they don't have to worry. They're, they're going to be fine because that type of work is so specialized, it's changing all of the time, very hard to keep up, and there's a lot of money at stake. Tax, tax law, or tax advice of that sort, you know, at the, you know, when you're advising BHP. 
absolutely. There's no no question. There's not a lot of room at the top, um, but but you know that's not going to change. The other area that is not going to change at all, um, or at least not going to change very quickly, is litigation. Uh, weirdly enough, going and becoming a barrister who is actually you know slightly more technologically literate than than most of the not very technologically literate barristers, you're going to be fine because litigation in its day to day advocacy kind of work is not going to change dramatically. Um, there will be certain areas that that will, but um, and, and you know we'll we'll see lots and lots of um, online dispute resolution or automated dispute resolution systems, but that's at the sort of the low end of the market, and that's not where where most people are working anyway. So so yeah, li litigation and, and and high in commercial work. Yeah, I, I, that was actually going to be my next question because I read in your paper you talked about barristers not being impacted, although clerks are likely to be in a bit of trouble. Well, so, so if you think of it, if you think about the platform idea, the death of the law firm, right? So this idea yeah. of a platform that actually does these sorts of things, um, on, online platforms actually can take the place of barristers, clerks like that. Right, yeah. like you know, it's just it's just tradition and and sort of slow pace of of change that the that the bar tends to prefer. That we haven't actually seen these sorts of platforms emerge for for the bar. And there, there is actually one, I believe, or there's a trial that's going on in in Britain. Realized uh, barristers clerk, um, but but that's the obvious area. Um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be buying a barristers clerking uh, business um, uh, if if I were you. Or actually, maybe I would, and then you know radically transform it. So. I can and um. Serve, you know, sorry. Thousands of barristers than sorry, just lost you a little bit there at the end. Um. Yeah, sorry. No, that was a bit unstable. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, my other question was around, we've talked a lot about lawyers and barristers and the profession. Within, when we talk about the profession, we didn't, we haven't really said much about judges. I know, again, in your paper, you talk about, um, you talk a little bit about judges um, at lower levels. What do you think um, uh, about judges when we talk about more sort of high level judges and judgments? Do you see those being taken over by algorithms? No, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see judges um, embrace the technology to be able to improve the, um, the outcomes for, for litigants. Um, I don't see a lot of examples of that. Um, so one of the, I've had a couple of projects um, uh, where there's been sort of a lot of pushback from judges because they don't really like the idea that the computer systems are going to take over um, the, the process of, of, of judgment. Um, so the, the one that where we got the most pushback um, was, was in um, uh, guidance around sentencing. Um, you know, the machine learning systems can, can give you really, really good predictions because there's lots and lots of evidence out there, lots and lots of, of sentencing decisions, um, can give you really, really good guidance uh, about um, uh, you, you know, you're up on a drug charge, uh, you had, you know, five grams of cocaine, you've got a prior, there was violence, you know, like what is the likely tariff that you're going to get? Um, we can predict that really pretty accurately. Judges hate that. They just absolutely hate it because what you're doing is you're, you're taking away their, their discretion. The area where we've had a little bit more success is, is around settlement of cases where the systems give guidance to the litigants that if you end up at trial, you're likely to do worse than this particular um, this particular settlement. So take this settlement. And so that's a project that um, I'm working on at the moment. It's, it's still in its early stages, which I'm just calling the Calder Bank project, because in civil litigation, a uh, Calder Bank offer is where you make an offer with prejudice, essentially. And you say, if at trial you end up doing worse than this, you pay my costs, right? And, and I think that there's real room to settle cases quickly if you have this system that says this is a likely outcome, if you want to proceed and you do worse than this, then you end up paying the other side's costs. Um, that's that's an area of, of interest. Some judges have said that they're interested in it. It's it's hard to get a lot of traction, I have to say. Um, you know, it's it's yeah, trying to explain uh, convolutional neural nets to judges is a <laughs> you're on a hiding to nothing. It's not a great yeah. experience. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that brings us to time. I would like to once again thank Professor Dan Hunter for his time and an excellent presentation.
and sure. thank our thank uh, discussants, Professor Raj Vasa and Professor Jeff Craig, and our audience for your engagement and some really fantastic questions that we had coming in. Um, and that brings us to the end. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>